And what is it with Bad Boy and his artists becoming religious? Shine is like Hasidic. Hasidic Jew, right? Loon. Loon is Muslim. Yep. Mace is back and forth, Bible yeah. pumping, goes back, comes back, goes back. True. What is up with people dealing with Puffy and turning religious? Well, I mean, or dying. There's a thing called the Bad Boy Curse. It, I think so. I think that's what it is. I mean, G. Depp's in prison for turning himself G. in. G. Depp turned himself in for a, a 20 year old. He was like, I felt bad about myself. That it was God talking to me. You know what I'm saying? Because of the way it made me feel emotionally. I broke down, started crying all over the place in the car. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was thinking about trying to do this to somebody. Because it was really in my heart. You know what I'm saying? I was going to do it. Did Diddy play a role in Craig Mack's death? Many people have asked this question over the years. Craig Mack was a rapper known for his hit song, Flava In Your Ear, but his career took a strange turn. Some say Diddy, who helped launch his career, was involved in things that led to Mack's downfall. Others believe Diddy turned his back on him when Mack needed help the most. And anybody who knows and was around at that time knew that he was the catalyst that made Bad Boy and Big what they was. What really happened between them? Was there more to Mac's death than we know? Now, the truth about Diddy's connection to Craig Mac's death is finally being revealed. But before we get into the details, we need to take a moment to look at where it all started. Craig Mack, born on May 10th, 1971, in the Bronx, New York, grew up surrounded by the sounds of hip hop. He spent most of his younger years in Long Island, absorbing the music and culture around him. As a teenager, Mack took on the stage name MCEZ, showing his growing passion for making music. Even though most people remember him for his work with big names like the notorious B.I.G. and Diddy, his career actually started with another music legend, Eric Sermon. Craig Mack's journey began when he met Eric Sermon and the duo EPMD, a well-known rap group from Long Island. In the mid-1980s, Max started working for them, not as a performer, but as a roadie, helping behind the scenes. His relationship with EPMD, especially with Eric Sermon, was strong. They believed in his talent and had plans to launch his career through their label, Hit Squad. Unfortunately, things didn't go as planned because EPMD split up, and that left Mac without the break he was hoping for. Despite this setback, Craig Mack didn't give up on his dreams. After leaving EPMD, he struggled to find his way in the music industry. That was until he crossed paths with Puff Daddy, now known as Diddy. Puff Daddy was working on building Bad Boy Records and was looking for new talent. A chance meeting outside a club in New York City led to Mac being introduced to Puff Daddy. Impressed with Mac's unique style and talent, Puff decided to give him a shot. Soon after, Craig Mack became the first rapper to release a single under Bad Boy Records. His debut song, Flava In Ya Ear, dropped in 1994 and quickly became a hit. The song was catchy, full of energy, and showcased Mac's distinctive voice and style. It climbed the charts, reaching number nine on the Billboard Hot 100 and eventually going platinum. The success of Flava In Ya Ear opened doors for Mac. I got with somebody, you know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna say their names, I'm just gonna say somebody that wanted to do another album with me. So I said, cool, I go, I gave him my price. And the price was to me it was low. You know, and he was supposed to give me the money. And I go in the studio and I start banging out. Now Craig Mack's story is a perfect example of how Diddy built his empire on his back. Diddy decided to remix the song, adding other bad boy artists like Biggie Smalls to the track. That remix became just as popular, cementing Craig's place in the hip-hop world. However, behind the scenes, things weren't as smooth as they seemed. Diddy tried to market Craig and Biggie as close friends, a dynamic duo leading Bad Boy Records. But the truth was much different. Craig and Biggie didn't get along at all. Biggie admitted later that he didn't even want to be part of the remix, but he felt pressured by Diddy to do it. Craig wasn't thrilled about the situation either, but they both had little choice. And uh, is uh, Craig on the album? Matt? Yeah. No. no. <laughs> You can't curse? Yeah, you can curse. <laughs> don't don't f Craig. Diddy would often refer to Craig and Biggie as the foundation of Bad Boy, claiming that they were key to the label's success. But that foundation didn't last. 
Craig eventually left Bad Boy Records. While Craig never publicly spoke against Diddy, it was clear that something was off between them. Over time, it became clear that Craig's departure was just one of many falling outs between Diddy and his artists. Other Bad Boy artists, like Tanya Blount, Mace, and Shine, face similar problems with Diddy. And what is it with Bad Boy and these artists becoming religious? Shine is like Hasidic. Hasidic Jew, right? He, Loon. Loon is Muslim. Yep. Mace is back and forth, Bible yeah. thumping, goes back, comes back, goes back. True. What is up with people dealing with Puffy and turning religious? Well, I mean, the... Or dying. Tanya Blount was promised her album would be released, but ended up waiting with nothing to show for it. Mace, another one of Diddy's artists, claimed that Diddy refused to pay him what he was owed. And then there was Shine, who ended up going to prison for a crime Diddy was allegedly involved in. While Shine was serving time, Diddy dropped him from the label. It seemed like a pattern was emerging. Diddy's artists left his label feeling betrayed and exploited. So he came to me and was like, yo, I can only cut you a third of the money I'm supposed to give you. I said, you know what, man, I want to do these songs. You know what I'm saying? If you're going to do this and that and the third, let's do it. You give me the money as we go. Craig Mack's story followed a similar path. After leaving Bad Boy, he shared bits and pieces of his experience, but was careful not to mention Diddy's name directly. He hinted at a person who had promised to work on an album with him, but ultimately did him wrong. Everyone knew Craig was talking about Diddy. According to Craig, this person wanted to work on another album with him, but offered to pay him far less than what he was worth. Craig accepted the deal, hoping things would work out, but Diddy didn't follow through. Craig felt undervalued and betrayed, a feeling shared by many other artists who had worked with Diddy. Next thing I know, money come, you know, with this, with this, this bullish mafia mentality with him and his goons and all that stuff like that. You know, talking about, yo, you know, you owe us an album. And I'm like, excuse my friends, but I don't owe you shit. You owe me money. The relationship between Craig and Diddy eventually got worse. When Craig tried to talk to Diddy about money, things got heated. Craig mentioned feeling unsafe after Diddy reportedly started threatening him. Though Craig never named Diddy directly, the frustration was obvious. Diddy had wronged Craig financially and professionally. Gene Deal, Diddy's former bodyguard, later came forward with his side of the story. Gene claimed that Craig didn't want to be Diddy's pushover. He recognized that Diddy wasn't trustworthy and eventually decided to walk away from the toxic situation. Things got even messier when Craig decided to change his manager, hoping to get someone who would actually support his career. But if you look at the numbers and everything, that that Ready to Die album wasn't doing good in his first six months. You understand what I'm saying? Craig Mack single had blew up, flavor in your ear. You understand? Which may be jealous of after Craig Mack left Bad Boy Records, he teamed up with Eric B. Eric B. took on the role of executive producer for Mack's second album, Operation Get Down. There were rumors that Mack might lead a new label called Death Row East, which Eric B. and Sergey Knight were planning back in 1996. However, this never came to pass. Operation Get Down came out in 1997, featuring production from some notable names like Johnny J., who had worked with Tupac and Prince Marky D from the Fat Boys. Even with this talent involved, the album didn't do well. One of the songs, Jock and My Style, had a video that showed Max sneaking into a party where people were copying his style. This may have reflected how Mac felt about being overlooked in the music industry. His second album was released through Street Life Records, but it didn't get much attention. The reviews were average, and the album didn't reach the top 40 on the charts. It also didn't go gold, which means it didn't sell enough to be considered a big success. The lead single, What I Need, didn't make much of a splash either, only peaking at number 16 on the Hot Rap Singles chart. After this, Mac mostly stepped away from the music scene. He only made a few appearances on soundtracks and released some underground tracks that didn't reach a wide audience. Diddy wasn't happy about all the efforts he was making and demanded that Craig fire his new manager. When Craig refused, Diddy told him he wouldn't be able to work with Bad Boy anymore. 
This power struggle between them created more tension. It got to a point where Craig Mack felt so threatened by Diddy that he considered taking drastic measures to protect himself. Craig had planned to unalive Diddy if he continued to threaten him. After all, it had come down to survival for Craig. If he didn't stand up for himself, Diddy was going to ruin his life forever. Sitting there and talking to God, I'm like, Lord, I don't want to do this. But if it comes to getting ugly where somebody's going to be trying to kill me, I'm going to have to do something first. But what happened next will shock you just as much as it shocked Craig Mack. Craig was sitting there thinking of unaliving, but God had other plans for him. In a miraculous moment, Craig heard gospel music on the radio that completely changed his heart in a moment. That it was God talking to me, you know what I'm saying? Because of the way it made me feel emotionally, I broke down, started crying all over the place in the car. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was thinking about trying to do this to somebody because it was really in my heart. You know what I'm saying? I was going to do it. In a split second, all the negative thoughts left Craig's mind, and he knew God would never want him to commit such a sin. Craig broke down into tears and repented the horrible thoughts. It looks like God gave Diddy another chance to make amends in his life. This incident had such a huge impact on Craig that he completely gave up on Hollywood life. He disappeared completely for six years and then later reappeared as part of a cult. Looks like he really did see God that fateful night when he had planned to unalive Diddy. Then he moved to the South and joined a religious group called Overcomer Ministry in Walterboro, South Carolina. Tyler Huckabee, a writer for the Washington Post, described the Overcomer Ministry as very strict and conservative. Craig Mack embraced his new faith. He even shared his beliefs through music. He released songs like When God Comes, which showed how important his faith had become. Eric Sermon said Mac found this church during a tough time in his life. Another friend believed that Mac was genuinely happy with his new life, even if some people didn't understand why he made such a big change. Craig's journey to the Overcomer ministry was unexpected. Growing up in Suffolk County, New York, he looked up to hip hop legends like LL Cool J and Run DMC. However, this new path with Overcomer ministry changed everything for him. The church was led by a preacher named R.G. Stair, who had a controversial past. In 2002, Stair was arrested for serious charges related to inappropriate behavior. He pled guilty to lesser charges and went to jail. Unfortunately, in December 2017, Stair faced more trouble with the law, including charges of sex <laughs> kidnapping. Despite these dark issues surrounding the church leader, Craig remained dedicated to his faith in the community until he passed away. Eric Sermon shared, Craig wasn't in a good place. He was going through some tough times and that's how he ended up in South Carolina. Even though he was deeply involved in the church, Craig never fully let go of his rap roots. In 2017, he released the Mac World Sessions, a collection of raw recordings that reminded people of his earlier career. It showed that he was still searching for where he belonged, just like he had been trying to find for years. When the Bad Boy Family Reunion Tour started in 2016, Craig chose not to take part. His commitment to Overcomer Ministry was more important to him. While his old friends from Bad Boy Records reunited on stage, Craig was performing in front of churchgoers, using his music to express his spiritual beliefs. On May 21, 2016, while The Brooklyn Show was happening, Craig was sharing his music with his church community, fully immersed in his faith. Diddy respected Craig's decision to skip the reunion tour. Diddy said he understood that Mac wanted to focus on his ministry. It was clear that Craig's choice was not about ego or hard feelings. It was about his commitment to his faith. Eric Sermon later revealed that Craig's health played a big role in his decision. He didn't share much about his health issues, but he eventually reached out to close friends. This week, the hip hop community was hit hard when the news broke that legendary rapper Craig Mack died at the young age of 46. Craig Mack's health had been getting worse since 2014. He suffered from severe symptoms and lost a lot of weight. He often told his friends and family that he was dealing with heart failure. However, the exact nature of his illness remained unclear for some time. In the months leading up to his passing, his condition worsened significantly. He became bedridden and needed help to walk. His family visited him shortly before he died, giving them a chance to say their goodbyes. 
On March 12, 2018, Craig Mack passed away at the age of 47 in Walterboro, South Carolina. Initially, his death was linked to congestive heart failure, and many people accepted this explanation. However, later rumors suggested that complications from HIV might have contributed to his death as he had not been taking medication. This claim was later confirmed based on his death certificate. Even after his death, the tension between him and Diddy remained. Craig made it clear that he didn't want Diddy or anyone from Bad Boy to attend his funeral. When Craig died, celebrities shared tributes online, but none of them, including Diddy, showed up at his funeral. DJ Scratch, one of the few notable figures at the funeral, later said that Diddy claimed he didn't know when the funeral was happening. Scratch wrote, I've never been to a service for someone famous, and I was the only famous person to show up. Very weird day today, but what put a smile on my face is that Lil Bro was at peace way before he passed away. That's what matters most to me. Scratch also revealed that Diddy had offered to help with the funeral costs, but Craig's family turned down the offer. It was a complicated situation, made more difficult by Craig's religious community, which didn't allow many of Craig's old friends and colleagues to attend the service. Gene Deal later clarified that Craig's issues were specifically with Diddy, not with everyone. Craig believed that Diddy would try to use his death to get attention, and unfortunately, his instincts were right. Many people found it hard to believe that Diddy, who hadn't spoken to Craig in years, suddenly wanted to pay for his funeral. Some speculated that Diddy felt guilty for the way Craig's career had ended. Diddy paid tribute to him on social media. He said, Craig Mack, you were the first artist to release music on Bad Boy and gave us our first hit. You always followed your heart and had an energy that was out of this world. You believed in me and in Bad Boy. I will never forget what you did for hip hop. Mac's debut record producer, Alvin Tony, who worked on Project Funk Die World, informed an outlet that he and the disgraced rapper recently met up at Mac's church to discuss filming a documentary on his choice to leave the spotlight to devote himself to his faith. Tony said, nobody got to understand his story. I wanted the world to know the talent he had. It was something I wanted people to enjoy, but it was cut short because he was very religious and wanted to go to church. My name is Craig Mack. And uh, uh, what did you used to do when you was in the world? Wickedness. Wickedness. Oh, okay. <laughs> and what are you doing now? Righteousness. Whoa, hallelujah. Eric Sermon also tweeted about Craig releasing his fourth album right before his death. I'm devastated over the news of Craig Mack. We just finishing up his new album. Rest in power, Craig. Easy Mo B sent a heartfelt tribute to his friend Craig on his social media accounts. In the same message, he mentioned getting a call. I'll tell you what's so disappointing about his passing away. About three months ago or so, I finally got a hold of him, and we talked for over an hour. Most of the call was me trying to persuade him to start making music again. He felt like after giving his life to God that maybe he shouldn't rap again. He further wrote that Craig had finally agreed but he didn't call back afterward. Maybe he knew he was about to die and didn't want to tell me. One of the reliable sources I spoke to not long ago tonight told me that he had told somebody, I'm not gonna be here much longer, Moby added. Well, in the six years after Craig's death, there has been no word about a documentary on his life and work. Meanwhile, according to Rolling Stone and Mac's death certificate, the cause of his death was related to HIV AIDS and he refused to seek treatment. The outlet noted that it was Mac's family who honored his wishes and repeated his assertion that he had congestive heart failure. His first wife, Roxanne Hill Johnson, and brother Andrew claimed that Mac learned of his diagnosis before using the church as a shield to ward off the shadows of his past. Andrew expressed, I believe he was very much in denial, but that's him living his truth to the end. I know that sounds really crazy, but you have to know him to understand that. As much as that bothers me, I understand why he did what he did. He lived his truth. After he passed away, his family started to ask a lot of questions. They want to know more about his life and what really happened to him. Some believe that his connection to the church might have influenced his choices, including his treatment for an illness. Craig's daughter, Amanda, feels like she may never find out the truth about her dad's decisions. She says that joining the Overcomer Ministry, a church, was a big mystery. Amanda believes her father wanted to find God, but it ended up being a bad situation. 
Even with all the confusion, she forgives him, understanding that he had good intentions. On the other hand, Craig's sister, Roxanne, feels very differently. She believes Diddy played a huge role in her brother's problems. Roxanne called Diddy a catalyst, meaning she thinks he sparked the trouble in Craig's life. She said, he effed my family up, showing her anger towards Diddy for what happened to her brother. During his time at Bad Boy Records, Craig was not happy. His family says he was working hard to get out of the label. He even filed for bankruptcy to break his contract after his second album, Operation Get Down. But things did not go as planned. Craig thought about signing with Death Row Records, run by Sug Knight. However, when Diddy found out, he was furious. Roxanne shared that Diddy made Craig drop his bankruptcy claim and pay to leave Bad Boy. Roxanne explained, Puff was pissed Mac was leaving Bad Boy and that Diddy was enraged. It seems Diddy was not just upset, but also took it personally, leading to a tough situation for Craig. Johnson, another family member, said Craig was afraid of Diddy, which is very sad. Many people in the industry saw Diddy as someone powerful and sometimes scary. Diddy's reputation for exploiting his artists is well known. He would take money from all of them, paying far less than they deserved to line his own pockets. Mace, another artist who worked with him, openly protested against this unfair treatment. In response, Diddy began demanding receipts trying to shift the blame onto his artists. This pattern of behavior has led fans to complain that Diddy damages every musician he signs. Many artists seem to have unfortunate endings with their careers suffering under his control. The only person truly benefiting from this system appears to be Diddy himself, as he continues to accumulate wealth at the expense of those who helped build his empire. But it looks like Diddy's luck has finally run out. He recently got arrested in New York, and honestly, a lot of people are saying it's been a long time coming. Over the years, he's been tied to some pretty heavy accusations, from things like SS to even and physical Now it seems like everything's catching up to him. The details of the charges haven't been fully revealed yet, but the word on the street is that they're tied to a big criminal investigation involving S and other serious crimes. This isn't just local cops we're talking about either. Federal agents have already raided his homes in Beverly Hills and Miami. The walls are closing in and fast. What's got people really buzzing is how the whole arrest went down. There's a lot of chatter about how the feds actually arrested him a day earlier than they originally planned. The theory is some folks think the authorities might have been worried that Diddy was a flight risk or worse, that he might harm himself. It's not just speculation either. A video of one of Diddy's former bodyguards has been making the rounds again. In that interview, Gene hinted that Diddy might take his own life if he ever thought he'd end up in prison. He mentioned that Diddy just couldn't handle the thought of being locked up like that. So with all this going on, some of Craig's fans are saying that it looks like karma is on the way. Sooner or later, Diddy would pay for what he put Craig through directly or indirectly. But one thing was clear that Craig Mack deserved better. And that is all for today. Until next time, bye.